welcome back. Today we are discussing episode 46 of the Play Dicely campaign, Void of Life. For a second there I was like, what was the episode titled? And then I remembered, because Void of Life was a very good title for this episode. But I am getting ahead of myself. This is an episode of Gombat. We are at the end of this druid enclave. We have traveled for days to get to this point, and this giant undead storm giant has crept up behind us. And Gombat begins. Starts off like any other fight. We are just throwing everything we can at this storm giant. And as we begin to attack it, we realize how little damage we seem to really be doing to it. It resists all elemental damage and has no vulnerabilities to speak of. And it is a tank. It is taking hits and it does not seem particularly phased. It also keeps doing this really cool thing where it manipulates the air around it and pulls us towards it. You get to make a strength save, but with three of our party members with negative strength modifiers and two of those three with an additional negative two to their strength right now, we are not making those strength saves. So the three of us that like to hang out in the back and shoot things from afar are suddenly pulled very close into melee range and it is not our favorite place to be. The storm giant also has an aura. We're constantly making constitution saves. This thing was not messing around. And it becomes clear pretty quickly that we need help. Just two episodes prior, we had found an iron flask deep within the confines of the Druid Enclave. And we know because of Identify that there was some sort of creature trapped within this iron flask. We don't know exactly what it is, but we do know that it will be friendly to us for one hour after being released. And so on maybe round two of this combat, when we have already realized that we are in way over our heads here, Nell pops the cork on the flask and releases the being within. And what releases from this flask but an earth elemental Dao genie, played by friend of the channel, Jason. Jason actually has quite a strong connection to this campaign. He played Tascam Tuck in the prequel campaign. But Domino, this earth elemental, swirls its way out of the bottle, lands, it is made of this big black onyx and it's got these green gem horns. It comes out of the bottle yelling, freedom, and it's playing a guitar. And he plays this like cool rocks, rock, rock, get it, rock. He plays this cool rock song and casts a mass healing word on all of us, which again, two rounds into combat was already very necessary. And the party is rejuvenated and ready to continue to fight. The fight continues on as it does. Another important element to this fight is that there are these crystals all over the map and each round beams of light shoot between the different crystals. And these beams are like five feet tall and hurt you when you touch them. Isn't that fun? So party members are also trying to hop over these beams of light or not and are just taking a lot of damage running through them. Even with Domino here, it does not feel like we're winning. Eventually, as the fight goes on, this giant pulls Elowen towards it once again, and Elowen gets pulled straight into one of those crystal beams. And that is enough to knock Elowen out to zero HP. And that's unfortunate. Not great, you know? We don't love that. Um, but the really unfortunate part of that is that this is the moment where we realize why that creature wanted to pull us into it so much. Because it has a cute little aura where when you drop to zero HP within 15 feet of it, you don't get to roll death saves, you just die. And we learned that very quickly because Azaria on their turn immediately tries to healing word Elowen. Thank you, Azaria. But it does not work as Elowen is dead. So the party panics a little bit. Drac leaves the mist, leaves the Archdruid, runs to Elowen's side, pulls her out of the beam, and casts Revivify, which is great and I appreciate, but he took a lot of damage getting over here as well, and now Elowen is up with one HP, and what am I supposed to do with that? It's just going to kill me again. And we don't really have time to process what just happened, and we also, I don't think, really understood exactly why Elowen had died in that moment either. And while we're still all trying to figure it out, this giant attacks Nell and Abe and knocks both of them to zero HP and dead in the same turn. So Elowen's alive, but Nell and Abe are dead. 
And Drac runs and revives Nell as well, but then is almost immediately killed himself right afterwards. So Nell's up, but Drac and Abe are dead. Nell steps up, grabs her sword, returned to her magically in the moment that she needed it most, and attacks this creature one final time. And the giant is killed, but it is a very somber event, as both Drac and Abe are still dead, and we only have one scroll of Revivify. So, a choice needs to be made. And it feels forever unfair that it is on Nell's shoulders to make these kinds of choices, but we do have to give credit to Nell and Christy for making a quick choice in a moment where a quick choice needed to be made. And Nell goes over to Drac, revives him. I don't know about everyone else, but I felt so stunned by the end of this fight. It went so wrong in a way that things haven't gone that wrong before in this campaign. This was the biggest mess we have been in so far. While the rest of us sit stunned in the aftermath of this fight, Drac runs to the Archdruid, shakes him awake, and asks if there are diamonds and if the Druid can help revive Abe. And the Archdruid seems to think he can and points Drac in the direction of where to pick up the supplies. So Drac runs down into the village and gathers them all up and brings them back to us. And the Druid does manage to revive Abe. It's such a wild turn of events. Four people died. And so in the aftermath of this, when four of us have just been revived, we have a nice little conversation with Domino. Because he's friendly to us for the next hour, so, you know, might as well chit-chat with the genie, see what's up. He tells us the tale of how he got trapped in this flask in the first place. He seems to be quite surprised about how much time has passed, but we don't really get to learn how long he has been in there. He tells us that he's a genie from the Earth Elemental Plane, and that he's in a cool heavy metal band called Super Mega Ultra Death, which was a very fitting title based on what happened today. As you do when you meet a genie, you inquire about wishes. And although Domino tells us that he is not powerful enough to cast a wish himself, he does have a father-in-law that probably is. He tells us that if we ever find ourselves in the Earth Elemental Plane, that we should come hunt him down and he'll take us to his father-in-law and we can discuss wishes. You know, casual. He does say that his father-in-law will require some sort of payment, And who knows what his father-in-law might like? Human souls, probably. But, you know, options. After that, you know, we sit down in the clouds for a bit and just rest. And while we're doing that, the Archdruid calls both Drac and Azaria to come meet with him. And he explains once they are all seated that he invited them both because they are both druids. And Drac says, of course, that he isn't, that he is a worshipper of Ishtok. The Archdruid explains that... Those who worship Vishtok are druids. And he says that he was the voice who called the dragonborn and the lizard folk and warned them of the desolation, brought them to the Ringsar Peaks. He expected that they would learn the druidic heritage, but it seems like something got lost in translation because they never really did. Though this very much explains the similarities we have seen between Drax culture and Azaria's druidic culture. The three of them all meditate together. Druids reunited, and this archdruid gives blessings to the both of them. Logan is now allowed to take more levels in druid, and also gets to remove one more of the caveats that exist for them because of their connection to the void. And Anthony is now allowed to switch Drax draconic race features from the D&D 5e rule set to the one D&D rule set, which includes one major change, and that is lightning wings, which is really fun. I'm excited to see Drac with his new lightning wings. At the end of this, everyone levels up two levels. So we're going up to level 11 now, baby. And all we had to do was have more than half the party die. Who would have guessed it? But that's it for the episode. I don't don't know what we're doing next time. We're done with the Enclave. Are we going back to Drac's home? Are we going to continue on to the next Druid Enclave? Is... Do we need to go figure out what is going on with Thalesville and Cardrack? Probably. Maybe that's a priority. I don't know. If you would like to find out live where we are going next, you can do so at twitch.tv slash playdicely next Sunday, March 26th at 6 p.m. Eastern. In any case, I hope you're staying happy, staying kind, and as always, remembering to play dicely. Goodbye!